Thank you, Elizabeth. That was really food for thought. And I think, um, uh, like you, uh, I'm very, very passionate about postnatal care. And I think uh, what I'd like to kind of get across uh, to our audience this evening um, is, is how important and crucial it is. It cannot be an add-on service. It's absolutely got to work. So, uh, uh, I just wanted to introduce you to some very lovely penguins just to cheer you up on the first slide. So uh, my talk will include COVID, some of the challenges, but you will recognize, uh, many of you will recognize how we work. And I think I'd make some recommendations of how I think we could change postnatal care. My slide's not moving and I don't know why it's not moving. Okay, let's just see. Okay, let's double click on that. Oh, sorry, it's gone back up. Okay, right. So we'll start with the journey like you do. The woman doesn't get to the postnatal bit, bit uh, without the antenatal journey. And, you know, there are huge expectations, aren't there, around a pregnancy. Most women get to the end. In fact, everybody gets to the end. Some have fantastic journeys. Some have mediocre journeys. And some people just, just don't have a very good journey at all. And that includes babies. But what do we do? Think about the, the way we nurture women uh, antenatally. Uh, we certainly monitor them consistently. We see them throughout our, the nine month journey. We scan them, we screen them, we advise them. Uh, and we hold their hands in, in, in many, many ways. And that contact, and of some of them are lucky enough to have make some really good trusted relationships with their caregivers. And then we build them up and we build up, hopefully including families and partners uh, for the actual birth. And if you think about that scenario of nurturing and trying to protect that mother and baby antenatally so that we have real positive outcomes and we take them through the birth process, and again, there are so much, uh, so many standards uh, and, and targets to meet in line with, you know, meeting all the antenatal requirements around screening, all of that. And then in birth, we are mandated to, to or we're told we must provide one-to-one -one care in labor. And that's a standard we have to meet. So just hold that in mind and think about then what happens just after the birth. So we've built them up and we've given them this massive expectation, but the reality is somewhat different for so many of them. And as Elizabeth said, uh, you know, as soon, it's almost a sigh of relief when the baby's well, the mother is well, and then the eyes come off the ball to look after the next lady coming in. But it is tough making that transition to become parents, let alone look after a new baby uh, who doesn't really behave as you thought it might do. Uh, it's tough being a parent 24 seven. Um, and the mental health issues, and often, you know, we include partners very much so at the Whittington. I know it's not the same throughout the country or maybe even globally, uh, but, you know, partners and family play such a crucial part uh, in the postnatal journey. And think about some cultures where the postnatal period is treated in a very precious way, where close family, close friends absolutely are there around the mother and baby. You know, they're given special food. There are rituals around postnatal care. Uh, the baby's looked after. There's somebody around to help mother and baby quite a lot of the time. However, we don't, I mean, in this particular culture, that's not the case. Many, many, many families are isolated. They're on their own uh, and many for the first time and circumstances are very, very different. So the help, they rely on us professionals, um, midwives and all the support workers and all the our earliest colleagues to really, really show them the way forward. So just to kind of think about the nurturing and how well do we really nurture them postnatally? And I would say that uh, midwifery services still very much are traditional in the postnatal sense. We did have mandated visit visits uh, before by the NMC. You know, when I qualified, uh, and I'm sure Sue will remember this, 
you had to see a new mother and baby twice a day for the first three days, and then every day till day 10. Uh, and then, you know, you carried on with some of them, uh, but then you handed over to health listing services. And over the years, that the standards around postnatal care have, I would say, okay, that's maybe you might say that's too much. You know, you couldn't possibly keep that up. And not all mothers wanted to see a midwife every day. I take that. But um, now, if they get three visits in their routine postnatal care, uh, they are indeed fortunate. And that seems to be the standard. And it's almost become custom and practice to say, we'll see them the day after they go home, uh, we'll weigh the baby, uh, and then we'll do the blood spot test on day five, uh, we'll go in again on day 10, and we'll discharge them. I'm very happy to discuss this afterwards, but that seems to be the pattern. But my question would be, why are we offering postnatal care? What's the purpose of it? Uh, yes, some of it is around clinical, uh, making sure the mother and baby are physically okay. Uh, they're recovering from the process and the baby is thriving. But I would say that what we offer postnatally has pretty much long-term effects on families. And if you think about the public health role of the midwife, uh, we always consistently are promoting health, health for the mother and also around infant feeding. Um, we are trying to prevent ill health. We're trying to avoid women having poor experiences. Uh, we are prevent, you know, preventing babies from being ill. Uh, and we do the clinical stuff around all the screening. But our professional advice and expertise is I think very valid. And I would say, to the audience, how often do you uh, have to run from a postnatal visit to a postnatal visit? You might have eight, nine visits. You have a clinic to run. How much time do we really get to sit there with women and be with women and families? Uh, we're pretty good at signposting to other services, but how well does that happen? Uh, and, you know, continuity. I mean, Elizabeth talked about consistency of information and continuity. And that comes up time and again uh, with, the, with the amount of complaints. Uh, when the complaints do come in, it's often about uh, inconsistent and conflicting advice. It's something to think about. But I think there's also a political thing around uh, the way maternity services are funded. Uh, you know, we know the money is behind labor care and labor. And mater it, the maternity package as a whole is bought. And therefore, for the postnatal side of things, uh, you don't get that much uh, funds in through trusts. And so I think, you know, there is some of that behind it in terms of the, the area of importance, if you like, throughout the mother's journey. We've got a mother and baby delivered, they're fine, we get them home, and that's it. And we provide a sort of a minimum level of service. And the other huge um, area uh, was safeguarding, which Elizabeth talked about as well. Uh, and this is so important for all our vulnerable families, um, you know, the amount of work you do. And I would say that a lot of our health visiting colleagues these days, a lot of their work is around safeguarding. And that old traditional way clinics, you know, all of that immunization, it happens. But the way they offer their targeted services now means that safeguarding is taking up a lot of their time. So then what have we been hit for? So uh, hit with, well, to use the, uh, the Cinderella scenario, you know, so Cinderella did not get to the ball during the pandemic. There were just far too many restrictions in place. So we've got a standard routine postnatal care that was already being, if, if you like, minimized. And then it's been impacted again in the last year. So we've had social distancing, uh, you know, we've had uncertainty, and when COVID hit us, there was a lot of uh, mixed messages around the PPE that should be worn. There was a lot of uncertainty around infant feeding uh, because the evidence just wasn't there. And we were all finding our way around how do we do this? And as an instant knee-jerk reaction, many trusts just stopped doing a lot of face-to-face -face stuff. And that included postnatal visits. 
Um, and we had not only did our service do that, but also early years did the same thing, you know. So where women would go to children's centers, for example, they all closed down. And then you know that schools did too. But there was reduced face-to-face -face contact for infant feeding as well as uh, being able to access services like children's centers uh, and social services, etc. So think about how difficult that would be or is for very vulnerable families to overcome where they already felt um, perhaps that the needs were not fully met. And in the last year, that need has even grown more. And of course, we were, we were hit by staff absences as well. So then we went on to the uh, virtual and remote world uh, and all the challenges around that uh, and engaging. And of course, it's kind of highlighted uh, the inequalities even more uh, because things like classes and things like postnatal stuff, um, we've had to kind of adapt the way we work uh, to that. So just going on about that is that what we don't know is that the impact of COVID is yet to be measured in terms of how families have come out of it. And the public health messages also didn't help us. We were told to stay at home, stay isolated and only travel and uh, when, when absolutely necessary. So the imp impact on mental health, increase in domestic abuse and breakdown of families has been more significant. And I think we're going to be looking at a COVID generation and potentially the impact of a whole lot of uh, children who might be affected by it. So what can we do? I think we should reinstate face-to-face -face contact as quickly as we can. We do need to protect staff and need to give them adequate protection uh, so that they feel they can get around and meet women. And we need to monitor well-being in different ways and be a bit more innovative in terms of offering support to women. And most of us can do that virtually over the phone, on videos, etc. And I think maternity hotlines are great for women to be able to access uh, midwives and including partners and family members, and that is really, really important, and signposting to early years uh, provision. We've done a lot of work on updating our maternity information on the website because of the ever-changing um, guidance that we've had. And what we need is this. I mean, I think Elizabeth already has said about leadership, et cetera, but we need more time and investment we need a lot more continuity of care. And we need, I think, postnatally, we need more measurable outcomes. This is something we don't have. Even the NHS long-term plan is a little bit vague on postnatal care. And involving our mothers in co-producing services postnatally, I think is really important. And working very closely with our early years team, it is very much a, a continuity of care from us to them. Uh, and we must try and hear the voices of women that we don't normally hear from. We must make an effort. And the whole stuff around perinatal mental health is really, really important, particularly in COVID times. So we can go to the ball. We can do postnatal care differently. And I think if we base it in the community, we uh, encourage social capital uh, that's a team of midwives who actually provide, uh, you know, caseload, continuity of care. We can, do, we can do examination of newborns in women's homes. We don't have to do it in the hospital. And, you know, and I think that women meeting women, families meeting families, empowering them, uh, helping each other is a really good way to go. So we need to think a little bit differently. So in summary... Postnatal care cannot remain in Cinderella mode. It will just fade away if we let it be that way. And we do have the power to change postnatal care that fits, is fit for the 21st century. We just need to think differently, work differently, engage differently to make that difference. And remember, the old traditional way of providing postnatal care really is, I think, not set terribly suitable for the now, for this day and age. Those are some useful references, uh, and I hope you've got some questions uh, for us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. 
For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.